Hi. Oh, hi, Beth. Come on in. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. It's so good to have you and the congregation come and watch the uh, service with us this morning. Uh, I guess since we're home. Yes, step in. Uh, you know, I, I'm Constance. This is Doris. And we have been living here for about two years. Uh, some of you would see us from time to time when we were home from our RV trips. But our grandkids wanted us to come and stay. We knew that Wichita was the place for us to settle down because we have a church family and friends, whether we're here at home and you're welcome anytime or in the sanctuary. We are blessed. So come in and find a seat. lift our voices together in our opening prayer. May the blessing of God meet us where we are. May the spirit of wisdom give us vision for the road. And may the love of Christ open our eyes to the needs of others. Amen. You can maybe seated. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed.
see any children this time, so you can all be my children. <laughs> when I was a kid, follow the leader was one of my favorite games to play. Have you ever played that game? Oh, yes, it's a classic. The rules are simple. First, you choose a leader, then you follow them wherever they go and do whatever they do. Fall the leader is a great game, but in our daily lives, we play fall the leader too. In school, in church, in sports, and in any other activity we might be doing. Every day, we choose which leader we will follow. One day, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and said to the people, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He who feeds on this bread will live forever. That is difficult teaching for some to understand. When they heard it, they said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Some of them quit following Jesus after that day. Jesus knew that many people were grumbling and complaining, so he turned to the 12 whom he had chosen to be his disciples and said, you don't want to leave, do you? As usual, it was Peter who spoke up, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The disciples had answered the call to follow Jesus. They were not about to turn back now. There's a song that some of you may know called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. It goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Have you decided to follow Jesus? It may not always be easy, but once you have decided to follow him, there is no turning back. Let's pray. Dear God, you have called us to follow you. May we answer, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. You love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. stayed on Jesus. Makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. stayed on Jesus. Oh, makes you love everybody with your mind when you keep it stayed. you in your mind if you keep it stayed Stay on Jesus. Oh, the devil can catch you in your mind if you keep it stayed Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus is the captain in your mind.
Ministries Committee. It has been one year since West Heights took a congregational vote to become affiliated with the Reconciling Ministries Network as a Reconciling Ministries Church. I don't have my slides. Oh, there's my slide. <clears throat> and this is the emblem of the Reconciling Ministries Network. Our committee has now become a part of the church leadership committee. We are looking on implementing ways to let members of West Heights and the community be aware of the work we are doing to become more inclusive. As our committee continues to move forward in our work, please watch for updates on our work in weekly church emails and the Logos. As part of our work, we are embracing the Reconciling Ministries Network's commitment to intersectional justice and equity. As a faith-based, social justice-seeking organization, Reconciling Ministries is making a commitment to start focusing on the intersectional justice and equity. Intersectionality is the theory that the overlap of various social identities as gender, race, sexuality, and class contribute to the specific type of systemic oppression and discrimination experienced to, by an individual. And this graph, picture graph, shows a simple diagram of what intersectionality is. You will hear the term intersectional or intersectionality more and more in news and discussions. When we took our vote last year, it was in two parts. The first part was voting on our welcoming statement. At this time, I would like to ask you to join me in reaffirming the West Heights UMC welcoming statement. At West Heights United Methodist Church, we embrace the United Methodist motto of having open hearts, open minds, open doors. We emulate Jesus by including through his affirmation, regardless of age, sex, race, ability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. We recognize that our church blessed by association with all human beings. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to my cohort, Constance, to talk about our name tag ribbons. Jason, we get our first slide? There, there you go. This is Gilbert Baker, a Kansan, who in in 1974 designed the the rainbow flag that we have in the back of the room there and uh, on the 25th anniversary of the flag they uh, in Key West Florida they made a flag that was a mile and a quarter long to show their pride even the White House was uh, lit up in the rainbow colors the night that uh, the Supreme Court ruled favorably on same-sex marriages. The rainbow flag became the symbol of pride for gay people and now it has uh, advanced and includes so many other people. During the Nazi period, uh, hundreds of thousands of gay men especially were arrested and put concentration camps and and the symbol that was put on their stuff was a pink triangle. And in the 60s, people, some people tried to turn that in and reverse its meaning, but it wasn't really a suitable affirmation of we are who we are. And, and just a year ago, as Terry said, you all as members of West Heights became a part of the Reconciling Ministry 
that reaffirms the commitment that you will be friend, be helpful, be good to all folks that aren't just like you. In the Bible, all of you who grew up in Sunday school know this story that the, after the flood, the rainbow was created so that it gave a, a, symbol of, a symbol of faithfulness and of hope. And as a reconciling church, West Heights affirms that the LGBTQ people or any people, regardless of gender, class, religion, age, or race, are people of faith empowered to follow Jesus without fear. I'm telling you about the flag, and you can see it hanging in the back because those colors will tell all who see it that you and this church love and honor all people regardless of their sexual orientation or their station in life. After the service, those of you who haven't already gotten your ribbons on your badges, we'll have the table open back there and, and Terry will be able to get a ribbon on your uh, badge and we'll try to do that for a couple of Sundays so those of you who like me can't remember what it is you're supposed to be doing uh, can get there. The, so be sure you get it done today or bring your badge next week. The Methodists have had a motto for some time that says that we believe in open hearts, open minds, and open doors. Because the rainbow colors represent diversity, inclusion, and progress, and because Reconciling ministries are established to welcome all who have been excluded by Christian churches around the world. We ask you to get out and proudly show your colors. Thank you.
Good morning. Isn't it a great day to be together in this place at this time? <clears throat> the scripture this morning is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12 and 23 through 24. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me, front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't reach it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there, your hand would guide me. Your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me. But even the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine as bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. Examine me, God. Look at my heart. Put me to the test. Know my anxious thoughts. Look to see if there is any adulterous way in me. Then lead me on the eternal path.
What is it like to be known by God? Really known. This psalm is one of my favorites. It really touches on the intimacy with which God knows us of how God sees each and every one of us. The psalmist celebrates God's presence among us, almost like that of a helicopter parent, hovering around, knowing our ups and downs and our ins and outs. This morning, Doris shared 16 of the 24 verses of this psalm today. The psalm goes on to celebrate God with us in the womb, being there as we are knit together, talking about how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. Throughout this psalm, God's presence is with us. God's protection is upon us even to the farthest most reaches. It's a beautiful psalm, one that I like to imagine uh, the, the young Israelite tribe singing as they lift their hands in praise and worship, or perhaps joyfully as the women walked down the paths to fill their water vessels. Or perhaps for confidence as the people laid on their sick beds or walked through treacherous territory. The Psalms, which was the hymnal of Israel, contain 150 songs that capture every dimension of human emotion judgment, happiness, sorrow, hopefulness, fear, contentment, rage. The Psalms accompany us on our journey as well. As we go through the good times in life and also as we travel through those times when we feel that we are isolated or misused or mistrusted or misunderstood, they empower us and convict us Some address those times when God feels absent while others console us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm so grateful for this book of Psalms in our Bible. But what if they weren't there? What if we were given a Bible that was supposed to be the whole Bible, but it didn't contain any Psalms? or a whole lot of other books, for that matter. There is such a Bible, you know, and I'm not talking about those little pocket editions that are only the New Testament or perhaps include a a book or two from the Old Testament. I'm talking about a fully edited book presented to a group of people as the Holy Bible. The Slave Bible was published in 1807. It was commissioned on behalf of the Society for the Conversion of Negro Slaves in England. The Slave Bible was to be used by missioners and slave owners to teach slaves about the Christian faith and to evangelize them or for it was for their salvation. The slave Bible was used to teach some slaves how to read, but the first and foremost goal was to tend to the spiritual needs of the slaves in the way that the missionaries and the slave owners saw fit. Meaning it was edited to convey the message that they wanted understood. Joseph Lumpkin, in an introduction to the slave Bible, this is the Negro Bible, the slave Bible, selected parts of the Holy Bible for the use of the Negro slaves of the British West India Islands, now made accessible through its republication in 2019. 
Joseph Lumpkin writes an introduction in here, and he says, throughout history, the Bible has encouraged us to fight against our enslavement to sin and hell and death and the grave. But it has also encouraged us to fight against our fellow man who might choose to take our freedom and use it for his own purpose. Just as Egypt enslaved the Jews and used them for labor to build their empire, so were the slaves of Africa used to build the empire of the British West Indies and the United States. Just as Moses stood against the Egyptians and led the children of Israel out of slavery and bondage, so are we encouraged to stand up against the cruel bounds of slavery and fight for our freedom and the freedom of our fellow man. The clarion call for human freedom, freedom he writes, is found in many forms and in various stories throughout the Bible. But all of these ideals were stripped from and carved out of the slave Bible. White Christian missionaries and slave owners literally cut out parts of the Bible that had the potential to convey hope, encouragement, or told anything about the struggle for personal freedom. Under the supervision of Anglican Bishop of London, Bill B. Porteous, founder of the aforementioned Society for the Conversion of Negro Slaves, the Bible was edited down to a simple and understandable volume, devoid of any verse that could inspire insurrection. In addition, short prayers were prepared that related to the duties of slaves to their masters. Here's a couple of examples of the editing process. Galatians 3.28, which reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. That one was deleted. While Ephesians 6.5, which reads, Servants be obedient to your masters, was retained. All in all, about 90% of the Old Testament and about 50% of the New Testament was deleted. Our Bible contains 1,189 chapters, but the Bible given to the slaves contains only 232 chapters. And those 150 chapters of the Psalms, not one is included. Friends, as we take up our crosses this season of Lent and face the truth about the legacy of slavery in America, we expose a painful truth about how the Christian church was complicit in promoting the bondage of humans into slavery. This was one of many roles the church played in perpetuating human bondage using the word of God in an unholy way to promote the oppression of slaves is one of the most egregious forms of blasphemy. How does it make you feel to hear these words about how the Bible was used? It makes my stomach turn. However, it also helps me to see that because the church was complicit in promoting slavery, the church must be actively involved in healing the brokenness and the racial divide these earlier practices have evidenced into our present realities. The reality of this ugly truth in our faith tradition is a clarion call. Pardon me. It is a clarion call to be on watchful alert of how passages in the Bible can be taken out of their context, not properly understood in regard to the intended audience, and to be alert to words that are mistranslated to affect particular responses in order to condemn or subdue 
the worth of other human beings that promote the status quo. A case in point and relevant to our worship today is how certain passages in our Bible are used to condemn and deny the human sacredness of LGBTQ persons uh, that are uh, differently oriented or differently identify from, again, the status quo. Here in our time and in this day and age, the challenge to see clearly, to open ourselves to these truths, to examine what ways our failures to understand context, our decisions to remain silent, our refusal to embrace others who are not like us, how these kinds of seeing continue to oppress others. God is love, right? Jesus holds the standard of love above any other rule or law. And our actions matter. When we hear this psalm's promise of God's abiding presence with all who God knits in their womb, how do we as the children of God live out this promise of God's nearness and God's seeingness? for all of humankind, for all skin colors, for all uh, people of different sexual orientations. This Lenten worship series on liberation is rooted in the desire for reconciliation. For we are not free, not one of us, until all are free to live the life abundant which Jesus came to give us. Sherry Mills, author of The Lent of Liberation, Confronting the Legacy of American Slavery, writes, perhaps the greatest challenge to facing, believing, and acting on the truth is our limited perspective. We struggle to understand the words of scripture as they were intended, not only because of the distant context in which they were written, but often because we do not wish to read words that might convict us. We are limited by our place in history and our location on the city map, blinded to the realities that occurred not so long ago with consequences that continue not so far away. We see only snapshots, hoping that what is just outside the frame might make what we see more palatable. If only we could see as God sees. We know this is impossible. The Psalm tells us that God's knowledge is too wonderful for us. We are not able to reach it. It is unattainable. But God has given us each other to help us see what we individually cannot. Let us listen to the experiences of black Americans, read our country's full history, and hear God's word through the ears of the oppressed. God knows what is in our hearts, whether we acknowledge it ourselves or not. Let us have the courage, the self-awareness, and the humility to recognize when it is our own fear or discomfort that is keeping us from seeing the world more clearly. May we each know God's presence and protection as we continue this legacy journey. My pastoral prayer today was written by Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove entitled Gospel Reconstruction a lament for slaveholder religion and the ongoing racism that infects us from the book rally, Communal Prayers for Lovers of Jesus and Justice. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we confess that we have inherited faith that was used to justify the theft of native lands and the enslavement of black bodies. From this, our inherited sin, we ask for deliverance. 
touch hearts that have been shriveled by generations of suppressed empathy and eyes that have lost the ability to see siblings who suffer from systemic injustice. Grant us courage to renounce the false teaching that we can somehow know you without being committed to justice for all people. In your mercy, help us mourn the divisions among the body of Christ and work for its healing in the places we gather to worship you. Embolden us to resist the political forces that oppose the expansion of democracy by appealing to traditional values and idealizing a past when only white men were in charge. As we name and unlearn the habits of slaveholder religion, give us grace to draw deeply from the witness of the movements that have always resisted injustice in the power of your spirit. We give thanks that there is a river of witnesses that flows from Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass to Ida B. Wells and Howard Thurman from Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. to the prophetic leaders who guide us today, give us grace to follow them to freedom. For all of this, forgive us for where we have failed to understand, Lord, and in your mercy, set us free. We come also this day, O oh God, with heavy hearts for the incomprehensible loss of life from the deadly coronavirus. We think of the grandparents, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters that have perished during and because of this virus. Today we mark the still rising toll of 512,000 people with one minute of silence, during which time the candle on the altar will be lit. Today, we also remember our brother, Reverend Junius Dodson, who died Wednesday evening, giving thanks for his ministry and his support of all of God's children. Let us enter into this time of silence. Let us lift our voices in singing these words penned by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette to the tune of O Sacred Head Now Wounded as we continue in this time of prayer.
pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may have noticed that we've had a plate, an offering plate in the back of the church. And it is here you may give. We're not going to pass it. We'll leave it as you leave or as you came in. But let us have a moment of prayer. Gracious Lord, we give thanks for we who are here and others that are wishing and watching. As we lay our gifts in this plate, may we continue our ministry. May those who ask the question of what we do May they find on the special page that we have listed that they may know of our ministries, that you may bless them, bless each of us here. Now and always we give you the praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 